Yeah, welcome to Seismic Radio. And uh, we are looking at deception in the church. And uh, it's a very poignant subject, um, subject which um, personally I've been looking at for a couple of years. And uh, it's actually quite disturbing at the same time, yeah, quite disturbing because the church is a place where um, you know, people go for comfort, people go for trying to find out about God. And it's, um, religion is a very intimate thing. It's a very, um, you know, very close thing where the individual reaches out to God. And, um, and then on the other side, we find that um, people are using this platform for blatant abuse. And, um, and we find that uh, ultimately there's a, there's a lot of deception in the church. People are led astray. They're led away from God. They're led into religiosity and into other things. And, and ultimately, they're missing out. They're missing out on what God really has for them. And um, again, looking at another perspective as well, uh, what is the best way to defeat an army? And, uh, and, and there, obviously, there are two ways. One of them is, 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 you know, brutal force on the outside. But once you realize that the army on the outside is far too powerful and far too big, it doesn't really work. So you have to have a different strategy, and you try to... Uh, create or to lead a war on the inside of the army, on the right on the inside where the people are, and you try to to lead them, to lead them into you know destruction by um, <clears throat> working from the back. And I think that's what the enemy is doing as well. So um, uh, persecution has happened, and uh, the only result of persecution is that. Uh, the church became bigger and stronger because people saw that these guys are willing to die for Christ. The power of God was revealed in people's lives as they were, you know, fed to the lions in the arenas. And and then suddenly, about 300 AD, we see a shift in strategy by the enemy. And instead of fighting the church, he embraced the church and placed himself right inside of it. And we've got the rise of the, the state church. And uh, with that, partly the uh, the end of faithful, true, <clears throat> powerful Christianity. Anyway, we have got a problem, and the problem is deception in the church. And the New Testament is full of warnings. Yeah? Even before all this stuff happened, it's full of warnings right from Matthew all the way to Revelation, the book of Revelation. And we're going to go step by step, you know, chapter by chapter, uh, covering this aspect about... Um, uh, deception in the church. I wanted to go straight to Matthew 24, you know, end time prediction. And uh, Jesus is talking about the end times and what we are likely to face. And I thought, I can't really miss out this chapter. I thought I'm not going to talk about the leaven anymore. I'm not going to talk about the scribes and the Pharisees, but uh, we have to go through this a chapter, which is chapter 23 in Matthew. And <clears throat> Jesus, even though, you know, doesn't talk about our generation. He doesn't talk about the generation in the church, but he talks about contemporary, um, uh, you know, religious people uh, with the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And, um, <clears throat> but yet we find a lot of parallel as well, you know, today in Bible-believing Christianity. Okay, let's, uh, let's go through the text. I'm just going to do it uh, sort of chapter by chapter. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, Matthew chapter 23. And then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you um, to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they, s for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their uh, phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, uh, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, let's, let's have a quick look at this. And it's, it's, it's sweet, it's beautiful, especially if you compare it in, into sort of a contemporary uh, Christianity and see what's going on in there. Um, 
okay, so we've got the, the Pharisees and we've got the scribes and they tell them everything people have got to do. They know the, the law of Moses inside out. Uh, we have to bear in mind we are looking probably at a period where a lot of people cannot read very well and so they, they rely and they can't afford scriptures either. They were quite expensive so they have to rely you know, on what they were taught in the synagogue. And what Jesus tells them, he says, look, whatever they tell you, do, but but don't do what they do. Yeah, That's the first one. Why? Because they're not living up to whatever they're talking about, and that brings very heavy judgment on them. And he says, they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Yeah, Quite interesting. And uh, I want to look a little bit in, into modern Christianity as well, and it's very easy. You find this very often from the pulpit that um, you've got, you know, the scribe or Pharisee right at the pulpit and, and they are telling people what to do. And sometimes um, the burdens are very heavy. Um, uh, one example, I talked about it last time, is the whole tithing issue, yeah, which is not really um, new in the New Testament. It, it was a system designed for uh, a tax system designed for Israel, a Levitical tax. Um, but unless you've got a Levite, um, it's not really there in the New Testament. We, we can look at this in particular in, in some other other form. But what I found is that, that sometimes the sole issue of tithing, when you've got people who are living on a minimum, uh, it's a big burden for them to bear. And when you've got people who you know have got plenty and who live at a maximum, it's a joke. Yeah, so there are two extremes about the whole tithing thing, but uh, it's 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 like a burden which is placed on people, but other burdens as well. I mean, I remember a time when I went into Christianity, and you were told not to watch television, you were told, um, you know, not to have a TV set, which okay is fair enough. You know, there's a lot of rubbish, uh, even you know back when I came to Christ in the 80s. Um, which was sort of pumped through from a television set. And today, when I look at television, um, I do have serious doubts. The medium itself is not a problem, but um, the way the medium is used by godless people to propagate godless propaganda, you know, that that's sometimes a problem. And you find this... Um, um, you find this when you when you see what's happening on television. You find this from the lowest level to the highest level. You find this in children's programs, all the way to uh, you know documentaries and so on, yeah, where where people are just programmed, you know, step by step, slowly, slowly, constant trip. So I, I'm not saying that uh, sort of TV is a good thing, and I think today it's probably a lot worse than what it was back in the 80s. But um, but sometimes it's difficult to place burdens on people and to tell them don't do that. People need to come to an understanding that it's probably not good to have this and that it's maybe better to find an alternative form of entertainment when you you know come home after work or something. Um, there are other things as well which I came across very often, you know, looking back through through church life, which is like, uh, you know, meetings have to be attended at certain times. Um, you, uh, um, I mean, I've, I've met groups, Christian groups, where you have to dress in a certain way, where uh, you... Um, I've got certain rules about Sundays and, and, and other things as well. I'm not saying that all these rules are bad, and, and very often they are not expressively made, but uh, you get people who sometimes create a new law of Moses on the New Testament, yeah, which is not really justified and which is not in the spirit of the New Testament, but they create something which they place, where they place a burden on people's lives in... Um, you know, in their relationship with God. And they say, look, if you do A, B, and C, then your relationship with God is okay. If you don't do it, you're in trouble. Yeah. And so they induce a guilt complex and they try to control or manipulate people that way. And so sometimes it turns into a heavy burden yeah, to, to do this. Um, the most extreme example I've seen, if you ever study um, how, um, I don't consider them, by the way, as a Christian group, Jehovah's Witnesses, but if you study how they live church life, you know, where... Uh, stuff like birthdays are not celebrated. Um, there are a lot of things which are uh, rejected, you know, in everyday life. And it's, in my opinion, it's a big problem. Yeah, it's a very, very, very big problem. The, the the way they enforce religiosity onto people and, and almost ostracize them from normal society, uh, which uh, is just totally unbiblical, but... Um, but they take it to an extreme. And also, you know, once they've separated you from human society and the only point of contact you have is for these guys to, you know, hunt out their watchtowers, um, then they've got another nice little lever, which is if you, uh, since now your only human contact is within that group, 
if um, you don't behave and you misbehave, then you get shunned, and then that human contract uh, contact is going to be switched off. So they've got like little levers of control, which are uh, you know it's just group dynamics, um, very powerful, very effective, but um, uh, but <laughs> not really biblical and not Christian. Um, anyway, we find this very often. So if people place burdens on you, uh, one point to make is, is have a look and see whether they're actually bearing those burdens themselves, whether they are doing it themselves. If they do, you can have a certain amount of respect for them. And if they don't, uh, I would suggest to you to just ignore them. Yeah. Ultimately, you, st you stand and fall before your own Savior. You stand and fall before your own Lord. And you need to um, um, ideally stand and if you fall, you know, get back up again. But um, you have to be careful with rules made by men which they place upon you, which, you know, God doesn't require of you. And it's not really uh, apart from, you know, of a biblical context where very often where, where they do this and what they do. Um, okay, uh, now we've got a little thing about the Pharisees and the scribes as well. They love the best places at feasts and the best seats in synagogues, greetings in marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ. And you're all brethren. Okay, interesting as well. So we've got this um, clergy scenario. It's interesting as well that uh, when you look at sort of people in the first century, look at Paul, you know, the apostle of all apostles, I would say. Yeah? The, the guy, you know, who's been uh, eternalized in the, in the Bible, um, you know, very deep insight. Um, you look at this guy and what was he doing? He was spending most of his time in prison. Or he was making tents. And then, you know, when he had time, he would, uh, you know, hang out with the church and share the revelation, the wisdom he has had from God with them. Uh, his deep theology. But, uh, but that's Paul, you know. Uh, he functioned as an apostle. I'm, I, I, I wonder what it was like in the first century, like in the uh, 50 AD or so, if you, you know, when you met Paul. In 2 Corinthians, we, we see Paul, you know, justifying himself from some other super apostles. Um, and I guess when you met him, he was just like an ordinary guy. He was like a nice, loving, ordinary guy. You know, if you spent a couple of days with him, you probably, the guy grew on you. And you had a really good time with him. He was just like a lovely, a lovely man. Yeah, that's the way I, I see Paul. I don't think people would address him as Apostle Paul. They would probably just talk Paul, you know, call him by his first name, uh, not uh, Apostle Paul or Reverend Paul or anything like that. Um, and, and here we've got like an indication that, that some of the stuff which happens in Christianity is really is actually quite, um, you know, quite out of it, really. Um, I'll give you one example. There's um, one guy uh, who I know, a friend of mine, and uh, he's quite old now. He's in his 70s. And he used to be, you know, running a whole denomination here in the UK for quite a number of years. Uh, there was a, a small group of leaders who were doing this. And uh, he's an excellent speaker. Um, he was a pioneer in what he was doing. And I think the, uh, his heyday was sometime in the 70s, 80s. Uh, I know a little bit about his life and it's absolutely amazing. But when you talk to him, he insists that uh, he's just, you know, not Brother John or Reverend John or or whatever, but he just, you know, John is his name. He's John. Yeah, that's it. He, nothing else. You know? And and you wouldn't know, you know, if you, I, mean, I know the man and I know his history. Uh, if you just met him, he wouldn't boast about it and uh, you wouldn't really get to know him. He's just an ordinary guy who has had a heart for God and, and God has used him in an amazing way in his in his heyday. Um, but again, he, he doesn't assume a title. Then in contrast, you know, I turn on Christian television and I see um, people, you know, with micro denominations and self-imposed titles, uh, which makes me sick to the teeth. And, and, and they think sometimes, you know, by awarding themselves or being awarded a lofty title, um, they, um, they've got some sort of authority and uh, distinction. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a real problem. I think it's a real problem. And we see the same stuff in, in uh, established churches as well, that you've got your ranks. People go through the clerical ranks and, um, you know, rise up to the top with the title getting bigger and bigger, longer and longer. Um, we see the same thing as well, but all the works, you know, 
but all their works they do will be seen by men. That's what they make sure of. They make their phylactery, so that's part of their clothing, broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. So they've got their uniform, so everybody can see from miles away what they look like. Look at the church today. Look at the um, priestly caste today. And you can see the same thing that uh, within the Catholic Church, within the Anglican Church, even within Protestant churches, um, the preacher has to have a special garment so that it can be seen and that he can be recognized as a dignitary. The love of the best places at feasts, the best seats at the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men rabbi. Yeah. But you do not be called rabbi, one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Yeah. So that's really the key of it all. Um, I want to appeal to you, if you are in the clerical profession, to really look at this text, you know, see what this text is saying to you. And don't, um, I mean, obviously I understand, you know, we've got organizations, we've got institutions, institutions within a religious sector, they are built up and you may end up being a bishop or something, but, um, but your heart is the key thing, you know, you should distance yourself from all the external dignitaries or, um, I'm not sure what the term is, from the, the honors which have been awarded to you and just be a brother, a sister, and um, serve with the heart of simplicity. Um, and then we've got, you know, that extreme thing. Do not call anyone on earth your father. And I mean, I, I've got a Catholic background. The Pope, the term Pope actually means father. Yeah? In, in, in Italian, it's Papa. Yeah? And, and you think, oh, what's going on here? You know, we've got a very, cl very clear statement by Jesus Christ. And then we've got the guy in Rome. Yeah. What's happening here? What's gone wrong here? Yeah. And then one thing you can see straight away, something has gone dramatically wrong. There's a direct contradiction to what is stated in here and, and what is practiced over there. And I, I would like to hear, uh, you know, some of the guys um, from Rome, how they justify the title of Pope in the context of this verse. But uh, I'm sure they've got a way of doing this, you know, he being representative of Christ, Christ being God or whatever. I, I, I don't know, you know? but, um, but it's, it's, it's quite a problem, quite a problem. Um, the, um, the whole, the idea of a clergy comes right back from paganism. And it's, uh, it's, it's what happened in 300, um, in, the, in the fourth century when the church was you know, turned into a state church, and a lot of temples were turned into churches, where suddenly we find um, we find these bizarre things, these bizarre expressions, you know, and, and, and the clergy coming into existence. It's a big problem, you know, it's not meant what's in the Bible. In the Bible, we've, we, we have elders, we've got bishops, you know, or uh, elders and diacons, that's, that's really the two titles. Um, and uh, and that's the only kind of leadership we have. But then from a biblical point of view, you know, somebody who's a bishop is a servant of all. Yeah. But anyway, we, we're going to look a little bit further in here. Um, and it goes on, and do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ, but he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Yeah. So we've got like the inverse of the, the kingdom of God. You know, the widow with a penny, you know, who's really humble, but uh, is probably going to church and, uh, you know, cleaning the steps uh, of the, the church building and the toilets and, and so on. You might, you know, once you go to heaven, you might find her in the biggest palace, whereas, um, you know, some of the, um, the, big, the big guns um, who fly around in private jets and uh, have about five different cars, you know, all luxury and, um, you know, extract a huge amount of money from the saints to support their lavish lifestyles. Um, I would think some of them don't make it because they've been planted by the enemy and others, if they make it, they might be living in something equivalently, uh, equivalent to a garage or something. I don't know. Yeah, But that's what this text here suggests. So uh, we, do have, um, we do have a problem. Let's, let's carry on with this text. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses 
for a pretense, make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel a land and sea to win one proselyte, but when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold of the temple that um, that sanctifies the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift of th or the altar that sacrifices a gift. Therefore, who swears by the altar, swears by it, and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple, swears by it, and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God, and on him who sits on it. Okay, uh, let's have a quick look here. Uh, one thing we see from this text here is that the scribes and the Pharisees they seem to be motivated by money more than anything else. You know? And um, and then again, he says some interesting stuff. And he says that these guys are actually shutting up the kingdom of heaven you know, against men. So they don't go in themselves. And they, I'm not sure whether they're aware of it or not. Maybe, maybe they're self-deluded. But they also don't allow anybody else to enter it. You know? And uh, and it goes on in that you all widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayers. Therefore, you receive greater combination. So this is pretense is a big thing. So they are pretentious religious people. They make long prayers and, and lots of other stuff. Um, and uh, they impress widows, you know, who are alone and probably seeking God. And they find these holy men. So they give them lots of money. Yeah, and that seems to be uh, a key point here. They travel all over the world. They try to get a proselyte. And once they've won the proselyte, they turn him into something worse uh, than what he, what he was before. And um, we find something interesting as, as well. Um, so if you swear by the gold of the temple, you are bound. If you swear by the temple, you are not. Um, and if you swear by um, the gift that is on the altar, um, you are bound by it. But by the altar itself, you are not bound by it. So if you swear by that one. So they have like <clears throat> little rules, little extra doctrines to highlight everything for uh, you know for something that's on it and they put a big emphasis on the whole money thing you know you need to give money to god which in other words means uh, and i'm i'm going to interpreting here quite a bit which in other words means you give money to them yeah because they are the representative of god and they they'll be happy you know they take the money and uh, I, I don't know what they do in the olden days but they live very well off it um What do we find today? We find the same as well. I mean, I, I'm not going to mention any names here uh, for two reasons. These guys are very powerful and it might end up in a, in a lawsuit. Uh, and the other one is um, my big question when I, when I look at these guys very often is, um, are they sons of uh, hell or are they just Christians who are solidly deceived? And um, when you look in the, the Christian arena, I'm sure you find both. You find Christians who have taken all this terminology, they've taken all this stuff on board, and they are just deceived. But at the same time, you find um, um, people you know, in the ministry who I'm convinced have been placed there by the enemy strategically. And they're getting very rich of it. They know what the deal is. They go for the deal. They love it. Um, but but they probably know you know where the end is going to be and there are some people they are just you know twisted religious people they probably don't know that they are heading to hell <clears throat> they think everything okay and they are probably going to be the guys who like we read earlier Matthew seven I think it was so Matthew yeah Matthew seven who stand before Christ and they say haven't we done all these things and Jesus would say to them I never knew you you know which means you know I knew you and then you did something stupid. But Jesus says, I never knew you. That means they never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. They were just, you know, playing the religious game. Now, what do you hear? So, I mean, there's one guy, you know, very charismatic, very good. Um, you see him on television and inevitably he, all he's going to talk about all the time is you giving money to either the ministry he's working for or to himself. And you will become rich. And, you know, it's like this, this divine lottery and everything will be will be lovely. He, um, you know, he's got a nice doctor title, which he, you know, turns all over. Not sure how much it means and how much uh, the value is, but simple people fall for it. They think, oh, he must be a bright guy, so he must be talking. He must be knowing what he's talking about. But all he's doing is he's just doing the same as what these scribes and Pharisees are doing. Um, he is looting 
uh, luring people into um, a, a false religiosity and uh, obviously they're you know even preaching the gospel to some extent you know to make some converts but once they're convert then as far as they are concerned they become a legitimate milking object and they just milk that person for as much as possible the rhetoric these guys have is really really good yeah really good if you um <clears throat> if you don't have anybody just just you know telling you whoa 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 you know step back you know listen to what these guys are really saying these are just shysters they're deceivers um this is not biblical um it's very easy to fall for them very very easy yeah, and, and i found myself a few times you know being tempted you know to believe what these guys are saying and and you really have to go back and you have to go back to the word of god and to to just see you know what deception these people are splurting out but they are there <clears throat> they are not not just one or two of them there are loads of them you know go on the christian tv channels <clears throat> and i would say there's probably over 50 percent of them they are they are false and if they are christians yeah if they are christians many of them are just severely deceived i um it just really strikes me it really really strikes it it it's it aches me, you know, to see how far this leaven has gone within Bible-believing Christianity. How how other ministries of people where I'm convinced they are genuine and they are good people, they use the same terminology these shysters are using, and um, and they use the same mentality. So they feel that it's legitimate to extract money from the saints for all their various little projects, and they use the same methods of manipulating. Um, manipulating saints through, uh, you know, marketing strategies and uh, money raising or, or, or fundraising strategies. They use the same methods, yeah. And it really it, it it pains me and it aches me. I know that the desires and the intentions of these guys is correct and it is right, but at the same time, I uh, um, I um, I can see what they are doing is not right. You know, the methods they are, they're using is not right. They've just been borrowed from these, um, you know, these deceivers, these deceptive people. And it's it's a big problem in the church. We need to clean ourselves off these guys. We need to, you know, make a public stand and say that these guys, they don't belong to us. They've got nothing to do with us. And we um, refuse fellowship with these guys. And as as far as Christian media is concerned they need to throw these guys out they need to say okay go sling your hook um, we don't have anything to do with you uh, in the end the word of god is holy it is important to um, to stick to what the bible says not to go beyond it and and, and especially not to to use the word of god as a means for some people to get incredibly rich and to uh, you know get a lavish lifestyle and and justifying it you know to to say that these people are giving to god because you've got these money preachers um that's what's in this text here so it's you know for these guys the scribes and the pharisees the gold on the altar was important uh, the gift on the 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 gold of the temple was important the gift on the altar was important but not not the thing itself and so they were just twisting things around you know making it all sound holy good and religious uh, but really uh, what they were doing is just just manipulating people to you know have a shift in value so the value is no longer god but the value is money it's riches and that's what these guys are doing in our church as well they are they are shifting you away from a relationship with god to material prosperity and they are saying that that is important now let me tell you one thing and you may be listening I'm, I've, I've had both times you know i'm maybe i should make this point at, at this point here because i'm talking about the whole money issue and the the money pimps uh, within um within Christianity, you know, and quite a few of them around. Um, I had times where I was fairly wealthy and fairly rich, and I had times, um, several times in my life, where, where I really had to think whether uh, I can afford that meal, I can buy a certain type of food or not. Uh, I had times where I couldn't afford to buy milk. You know? So um, I know both times, I know the, 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 the times of poverty, you know, of just subsistence, of just getting by, and in all the times where, where I had plenty of I didn't have to think. So if I wanted, if I fancied something, um, you know, a gadget uh, or whatever, I, I didn't have to think I could just go and buy it and it wasn't a problem. Now, I tell you that the times where I was struggling and where I was rather hard up uh, were spiritually the best times in my life. The times where I had plenty and where, you know, I was surrounded by, uh, you know, 
the niceties of life were the times when my, when my spiritual life was really, really low. And, um, and so prosperity, material prosperity, is not necessarily the best thing. It's not necessarily something you want, something you want to ask for. Uh, if you go into Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 30, or around about there, might be 30, 31, and you look at what King Agua says, uh, or Agua says, Agua says, it's not a king, it's just Agua. Uh, Agua says that, um, you know, don't give me riches um, so that I turn around and say, who is God? And don't give me poverty so that I may be forced to steal and I dishonor the name of my God. So there's something in between which is good and which is healthy, you know, and, and there's something else which is very unhealthy. What you find is, well, it's a lot of rich people, they are very unhappy. And um, and their lives are very screwed up to to a certain extent. They, they they do have a lot of problems. Same people who are struggling to make ends meet is, is similar. It's very very hard and very difficult, and you've got all my sympathy. But there's something in between, and that's really what you should be looking for. You, know? um, you shouldn't be looking for status in this world. You shouldn't be looking for distinction in this world. You should just um, find where God wants you, where God wants to place you. What is the call of God upon your life, and then pursue the call of God upon your life and trust God that he will meet your needs and we've got this promise in uh, Matthew as well in the Sermon of the Mount and I think it's chapter 5 again I'm not sure check it out um, but where Jesus says that you know seek your first the kingdom of God and all these things and with these things he talks about you know what shall we wear what shall we eat and you know how do we pay the bills tomorrow that kind of thing um, and all these things will be added unto you. So there's really um, an importance to, to sort of try and get this right. Be faithful in the little things. Be faithful in what God has placed in front of you. And, and God will make sure that all the rest will be okay. And, and rely on this word as well. If you, uh, I know if you are facing unemployment, and uh, I've had a year of it recently, or just little employment here and there, but nothing, nothing permanent, nothing constant. Um, if you are facing a hard time, just, you know, call on to God and... and 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 rely on his word read those words and 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 speak them into your life yeah ask god to 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 make them come real but then you know let your focus be first on god not on not on material things not on prosperity and that's basically what these guys where these guys are getting you they are making you focus on on the gold in the temple and not the temple itself they're making you focus on the gift on the altar not on the altar itself the gift of the altar is is good yeah it's a nice thing but the important thing is really uh, the altar. Yeah, I mean, and I'm using Old Testament terminology. In, in New Testament terms, the important thing is not you know how much money you give to the church or how much money you give to God. Um, it is important to give and it's important to uh, you know to to honor God. But the most important thing is your relationship with God. You know, the rest comes out of this, out of your relationship with God. You would want to share you know, whatever you have with the kingdom of God, with the people of God. Uh, I hope I'm making myself clear. It's, it's, it's a very sensitive area. It's something which really angers me when I see, when I look into Christianity and I see this blatant abuse of what is taking place and people are not waking up to it. You know, people are just, yeah, you know, uh, uh, you need a jet. Yeah, uh, you know, I'll give you some uh, money or whatever so that you preacher man can have your jet so that you're, I mean, there's one bizarre stuff, and I'm quickly going to tell the story, and I'm going to move on. There was one preacher, and uh, his jet is getting a little bit old, and he's in this circle of these money pimps, and <clears throat> um, all of these money pimps, they've all got their private jets. Some of them have actually got two or several. Yeah. One of them has got even a private airport uh, with a ministry headquarters right at the edge of the airport, so you can just uh, you know, go out of the ministry and you know, climb in the jet, and he can fly wherever he wants to. Now, this particular minister, his wife and his um, children, they were on a trip to London and they came back and um, I think something was wrong with the courage, you know, the undercarriage, something broke or whatever, and they went off the runway. I'm not quite sure. There was a problem. There was a technical problem and he was really scared. Yeah. And now, when he did his explanation, it's quite interesting as well, uh, he didn't state that his wife and his kids were there on ministry business. Uh, it sounded, and I don't know whether it's true, um, if he didn't state that they were a ministry, um, and they were actually a ministry business, and he didn't state that they were, it's actually very, very poor and it's very, very bad publicity work, and he should fire his publicity guys. But if it sounded to me like they were on a shopping trip or something, you know, just like a, a weekend out, 
and they they were just jetting off on something which belonged to the ministry. Now, uh, bearing in mind, you know, we're living in the 21st century, travel from one continent to another is not that expensive these days. Um, but let me suggest to you, if you fly coach to London from America, um, it probably costs you about, I don't know, a couple of thousand dollars if you, you know, for a set of three people or whatever, there and back. If you take your own jet and you fuel it up, and you uh, have your own pilot and you have to pay the pilot, you have to pay for the landing fees, starting fees and all the rest of it. I would suggest to you that it's a lot more than a couple of thousand dollars. So it's not just um, uh, you know a few thousand dollars here and there, but it's a lot, lot more. And um, I, I despair when I, when I hear these stories. I despair even more that people take these guys serious. A lot of people, you know, this particular guy, uh, they, they really killed and mocked him, and it, again, it's a it's a blemish on Christianity you know, that we don't separate us from these guys and just say, look, you know, these guys are just deceivers. We've got nothing to do with them. But on the contrary, they're still sort of within uh, Christianity. People respect these guys, and uh, they let them get away with all the heresy and all the uh, you know bad stuff which is coming from them. Okay, let's go on further in the text. Uh, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Hmm, interesting. Uh, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone, blind guides who strain out a nut and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but the inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside you are full of dead, dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but Inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them and the blood of the prophets. Therefore, your witness, witnesses against you serve that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's good. Serpents, brood of wipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I sent you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scorch in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, uh, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation." Yeah. Okay, so we are still with the Pharisees, and we are still about the uh, hypocrisy. And we find a, a key point here. Uh, and I'm looking here. Woe to you, scribes, you hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and rice cumin. So they, they do all the little finicky bits of the law, and they discuss them and think about them and so on. And I've lost the text here. Uh, here we go. Um, but they forget about one thing, and that is justice, mercy, and faith. Yeah, faith is you know being faithful, being true. Um, hmm. They leave it out. Ah, Christianity is all about love, really. Um, it's a fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus told us that, you know, about false teachers and false prophets, uh, we can tell them by their fruits. It's interesting, very, very interesting stuff. So, uh, and, and it's interesting as well, when you, when you look at some of these super-duper preachers, just to see how they deal with individuals um, and how they, how they are relating to them. And it, it sometimes it tells volumes about these guys. Just observe them closely and see, you know, what are these guys all about? You know, are they just like these great showmen? You know, everybody adores, everybody looks up to. But then, when you um, when you do it, I mean, some they're, they're different. I tell you the story of one pastor I know quite well. Um, he uh, he's a you know showman type of pastor, and he. Um, you know, comes across very, uh, very powerful when when he speaks. Um, but I've seen another side of this man as well, and it's a positive thing. You know, that's what I'm. Mean. I'm not just knocking knocking them all. And I once went with him to a pub. You know, we had to discuss some business and so on. And um, he started talking to a, a waitress, and uh, um, um, he felt that you know she was in need, she was hard up, and he gave her a massive tip. 
I didn't think twice about it, you know, just a massive tip. And I, th I thought, are you crazy? You can't do this, you know. She would think all sorts of stuff. But but it was just out of the goodness of his heart, you know. He felt a burden for uh, whatever predicament that person was in. And he decided to try to alleviate a bit, you know. It was just like spur-of-the-moment decision. He didn't care, you know, you know, whether he had lots of money or little money. He just gave a massive tip. And, um, and that sort of spoke volumes to me about this man, you know. And 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 it was was quite interesting to see, and I would challenge you as well. I mean, very often it's not possible because these guys, you know, they're standing at the top. They're very aloof. Um, we don't know exactly where they um, uh, where they stand, where they're coming from, but uh, and we cannot see how they behave in their private life. But um, open your eyes, you know, when you deal with them, see how they deal with individuals, you know, whether they've got time for the for the widow with a penny or. Um, you know, uh, or you know, the poor person on the side of the road who's who's asking for help or something, or whether they don't, they're too important for them. I I, I don't know. Just uh, just watch them. Just watch them. And that's really what what Jesus tells us. That's what we should do. We should look at the fruits, see whether they are there or not, and then decide whether these guys are real or not. Um. Okay, we've got blind guides who strain out a nut. So it's all about the law, all about the the, um, the stuff. Um, little things, you know, they make very big, but they miss the most important things, which is justice, mercy, and faith. Um, and then Jesus talks about them. You know, on the outside, they all look wonderful, but on the inside, there's something really, really bad. There's something really wrong. And we are back to the fruits, you know. If, you know, people have got the fruit of the Spirit in their lives, spiritual fruits, uh, they will be whatever's on the inside will come out on the outside as well. You'll be able to, to see it. You'll be able to see the evidence of the fruit. And uh, again, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to, I think I've mentioned most of the stuff, you know, which we uh, talked about. Uh, Jesus warns them. And, and finally, he talks about them that they've killed the prophets. They've killed all the holy men. And these guys say, you know, if we were around in our father's days, we would not have killed the prophets. And they make, um, obviously, it's a rhetorical thing they make. They call fathers also have killed them. So they don't distance themselves from them. And we find this in Christianity as well. I mean, you might say, you know, what I'm doing here, you know, criticizing certain elements of, um, of, of you know, biblical Christianity or Bible-believing, so-called Bible-believing Christianity is... This persecution. I'm just calling for purity. I'm just calling. I'm warning people not to get lured into something which is wrong and being dragged away from, you know, the um, the the justice, the mercy, and the faith issue into something else. You know, that's really what I'm doing here. What I'm warning. You know, I'm not calling on doing damage or harm to anybody other than distance distancing yourself from them. And I think that's what the Bible says. You know. That's what we need to do. If people teach heresy, we need to distance ourselves from them, shun them, ban, ban them. I, I, I don't know, you know, which term to use, but basically, you know, make make it clear, you know, these are not from us. We've got nothing to do with these guys. They are different. They are doing something else. They are not us. Yeah, that's very, very important. It's not happening with, uh, within the church from what I can see. Some extremists <laughs> do it, but, but, not, but not generally. You know, guys are still recognized and they are still you know, invited all over the place and they're causing a lot of damage. Okay, so so that's the thing. That's what we need to do. We need to distance ourselves from them. And we need not be partakers. Now, the last bit of the, of the, um, the, the verses here, verses uh, 31 onwards, talks about um, persecution, physical persecution, physically killing people. And again, don't be surprised. It's happened, you know. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I get these figures right, but um, the established churches in medieval days have been actively persecuting Christians who did not join up with them. We, we've got the whole history of Anabaptists, and they were both persecuted by Lutherans as well as by, um, by Catholics. But we have to bear in mind that if somebody was a bishop within Catholicism or within the Lutheran church, um, very often it was a political office as well and they felt undermined by these guys who came in preached a different gospel which most of the time actually, actually happened to be the true gospel and, and they lost the hold and control over the people and so uh, they w went against them quite vehemently I was recently in Münster in Germany 
and there's still one church and they've got I think it's three cages on the church and there were um, you know some Dutch people they preached the gospel a lot of people came to Christ not all but a lot uh, they proclaimed the kingdom of God Münster they kicked out the bishop and the bishop got together had an army uh, eventually they routed the city and um, they got control over it and they uh, um, you know did the, the torture thing with the the leaders who were left and uh, and then they left the corpses in those cages for everyone to see and put it up a church tower a bizarre story you know you think what this is Christianity what has this got to do with Christianity it's actually happened you know it's happened in the um, I'm not quite sure 1500s late 1500s um, really shocking when you hear some of the things which are going on in Christianity. Um, um, there were crusades against Christians in, this, in southern France, yeah, not just against, uh, um, you know, in, in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem against the Muslims, but there were crusades against the Albigenses and others, and most of them were Bible-believing Christians. The Bogomils say they were so f getting so fed up. They were in Bulgaria, again, a bunch of Bible-believing Christians. They got persecuted by the, um, I think it was the Roman church, and they got so fed up with the persecution that in the end they opened the gates to the, to the Muslims under the condition that they can carry on living and professing their faith. faith. And that was in Bulgaria. So we had a, a lot of uh, examples in history where Christians have been persecuting Christians, uh, all in the name of God, all in the name of Christ. And it's just mad, total and utter madness. And we can see what's happening here. Yeah? And that, that Jesus is actually, he's criticizing his current generation, um, but almost talking prophetically about what was going to happen in the centuries to come. Okay, I'm going to leave on this point. I need to go and I need to uh, actually disappear here. Uh, again, the point I want to make is, is um, um, you know, put your life straight with God. You know, try and read the Bible as best as you can and get your guidance from the Word of God, from the Bible, and, um, and really focus on Jesus Christ. Don't believe these deceivers which are all around. All you need to do is just turn on Christian television and you get some sort of culture piped into your living room. Um, which is somewhat alien to real Christianity. Um, I mean, again, please don't get me wrong. There's a lot of good stuff there as well, but you need to filter it quite, uh, quite, quite stringently. There's also a lot of bad stuff and a lot of stuff which is, in my opinion, very, very sick and it's very, very damaging to your spiritual life if you believe what these people are saying. Um, so please be careful and uh, make sure that whatever you do, take your Bible first. You know, stick your nose in the book. Read it, understand it, pray about it, you know, pray about an understanding of the Bible, be open to the Holy Spirit. And if somebody uses the name Jesus and talks about Jesus, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are genuine. Yeah, it can mean that they are just deceivers and shysters. In the medieval days, we had people, not just a few, we had thousands of people uh, in the Inquisition, you know, in, um, in religious wars being murdered and killed in the name of Christ. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we can even go back up to about, uh, you know, uh, a generation, two generations ago. There were persecutions in the name of Christ happening all over the world, somewhere in the world. It's very, very disturbing. And it's, it's very, um, but it's, it's, it's truth, it's a fact, and we need to be aware of it. So, my friends, what I would like to encourage you is... Um, um, Open your eyes. Just open your eyes. Don't believe anybody who comes along, you know, with a, with a great message. We had it in biblical times. Jesus was criticizing them very heavily. We've got a template of what these guys are all about. Uh, one clue we've got in this text is they're they are about little things, you know, minor doctrine things, which they blow up to the uh, to the brim, and and ultimately they're about money. That's what they want. They are they are motivated by greed, um, and we can see, you know, the way they present themselves. They are motivated by status, by being recognized by being revered by people that's what these people are all about yeah. if you find the two true christians if you find true um true ministers of christ they're not bothered about status they're not bothered about you know being honorable being called reverend uh, or anything like that all they want to do is they just want to you know make sure that you get on in your relationship with god in your relationship with christ that you move on that you um do something positive, something good, 
with your life and that ultimately you will make it into heaven and you will look back on your life and it's not been a complete waste of time. There may have been a few problems here and there, but altogether, you know, they want to make sure that when you stand one day before Christ, that Jesus will say, well done, true and faithful servant. That's really their motivation in your life. And that's all they want for you. Nothing less and nothing more. And that's good leadership. Um, the guys who, you know, l like to hear their voice, like to listen to their voice, stand at the front, you know, make a big fuss about themselves, um, try and put their hands into your pocket, demand high wages for being a pastor. Um, they, um, um, you know, get into little tiny things and they turn themselves into some sort of personality cult. Be careful, you know, be careful. Some of them are just sucked into a bad culture. Others are downright deceptive. Yeah. Okay, um, before I finish, I just want to make a final point, and that is, you know, most likely you're in some church somewhere. You may be recognizing some of those character traits I've just been listing up and taking out of this text here. Um, I want you to pray for your leaders. Yeah? There's a great pressure on leaders, and there's a great... Uh, desire by the enemy to try and get these leaders to fall and very often they fall into minor traps I know it from my own life I'm not a church leader so uh, I can't talk on that level but um, I've been a leader in other areas and I've been falling in these traps again and again and again you know where um, I've done false decisions I've adopted a false culture and uh, my lifestyle wasn't the way it should have been and um, and it's very very easy to to fall into this so Take some time out, you know, maybe today, and just pray for your spiritual leaders and, and ask God to really protect them, to put a hedge around them, and to, um, you know, to give them wisdom for the role God has entrusted to them. Wisdom, protection, you know, the Spirit of God to lead and guide them. And uh, um, uh, I call it like a nose of steel, you know, that they are... Uh, hard-nosed and, and, and set on doing the will of God and, and, and nothing else. Okay, I'm going to leave it at this. God bless him. Thank you for listening. And um, we're going to, next time, for sure, we're going to carry on with Matthew 24. We're going to look at false messiahs. We're going to look at false prophets. Some really interesting stuff to go through. Okay, God bless him. Bye-bye from Michael here at Seismic Radio.